Hi, fellow believers in Christ. Today, I just wanted to talk about the story of Jonah and how it it is actually a story of forgiveness. And I just want to explore it with you a little bit. So I go here for a second. Oh, whoops, I want to go here. Sorry. Um, so God told Jonah, you know, go to Nineveh and proclaim against it that their wickedness has come up before me, which at that time the whole world knew. They knew about God because they heard, had heard about the Israelites and things traveled fast back then. Um, you know, you know, when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, news traveled really fast. And um, when Job was struck, news traveled fast because the world was smaller back then. And not only because all of the, not only because it was literally smaller, because the world has been expanding through time. Um, that's a scientific um, discussion, but the world has been expanding. But also the world was small because there were just not as many people in it. And um, so news traveled fast about things. And so the, the world in general, even though there were a lot of heathens and pagans, they still knew who the God of Israel was. Um, and they knew the God of Israel was really, really powerful. And so the Ninevites would have known that if God said their wickedness had come up before him, Jehovah, they would instantly know that that meant wrath, that wrath was coming to them if they didn't repent, because they had heard many times of God destroying other nations and stuff like that. So, um, so, so Jonah instantly, um, as soon as God tells him to go and, and, preach repentance and prophesy destruction to the Ninevites, Jonah instantly runs away from God to avoid not to avoid doing this. And um, <laughs> I guess he hoped that God would just pick, forget about him and pick somebody else. And, you know, you might wonder why did God pick Jonah when Jonah didn't even want to go in the first place? But this is a story about forgiveness. And so what we have to realize is um, Jonah hated the Ninevites. And he knew that the chances were really good that if they learned that Jehovah was about to destroy them, that they would repent. And, and he didn't want them to repent because he didn't want them to be forgiven and saved. He wanted the Ninevites to go to hell because they had um, like torn his people to shreds, literally. They did horrible um, tortures to his people and did, they, they killed his people. They did horrible things to the, to the Israelites. So Jonah didn't want them to be forgiven and restored and on their way to heaven. He wanted them to be punished for what they had done to his people. And this is why he ran from the Lord. He didn't run because he was afraid of the Ninevites. He ran because he was afraid that the Ninevites would repent. So anyway, um, it says he went to Tarshish. He got on a boat to go to Tarshish. Now in the Old Testament, Tarshish is England. So um, I did a calculation and I calculated. Uh, first, I found out how, you know, I know that Jonah went into the belly of a fish, not a well. Okay, and I believe that it was a fish because that's what the Bible says. And there are massive, giant fish in the ocean. There are monster-sized fish. So he could have definitely been swallowed by a fish. But just just um, comparing to a well, um, because I don't, we don't really know a lot about huge fish in the ocean and how fast they swim. So I looked up how fast wells swim and anywhere from 35 to 29 miles per hour. So then I calculated how fast or how far could a well go in three days because Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights. So that's 24 hours times three times 30 miles per hour, just averaging 
conservative amount. Now, again, I know it's not a well, but it's a huge fish, so it probably can swim as fast as a well. Um, and I come up with 2,160 miles. That's a really huge distance. That's the distance of two thirds of the United States. Now, um, Jonah didn't travel in a straight line. Now this is where um, Nineveh was. It's modern day Iraq. Okay, so that's where Nineveh was. Okay. And the land of the Israelites is right here, really close to Nineveh. Whoops, that's Lebanon, but here's, here's Israel. The land of Israel is right down here, really close to Nineveh. See, it's not too far away at all. You can get there pretty fast. But instead of going in a straight line to Nineveh, like, like Jonah was commanded, he got on a ship over here in the Mediterranean, and he headed for Tar Tarshish, which is England, way up here. So the only way to get to England by ship is if you go through the Mediterranean Sea and you go the long way through this thing right here and then up around that way. Um, I forgot what that's called. Peninsula, in between the two peninsulas. And then you go up around that way. So for him, it would have been a longer journey, a longer travel. But we don't know how far he got on his way to Tarshish when he got swallowed. He, he was probably somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea or the Tyrian Sea, which again, if if the big fish got him over here, for instance, um, that would be approximately the right am amount of miles that it would take three days and three nights for the fish to get him back um, back on shore over here. And I bet God had it, had the fish spit him up higher up here, closer to Nineveh so that his journey wouldn't be as long instead of spitting them up down here in Israel or what we call Israel today but the fish probably spit him up here because you know how God is God plans out every little detail very very well <laughs> so um, instead of walking this distance he actually went by sea by boat this way and then he went by fish that way and who knows, he might have gotten to Nineveh about the same time that he would have if he had just walked. You never know. Um, so anyway, um, so he was, now look how far he went. He didn't just try to cross over to that island and hang out there. He knew how mighty God is. So he planned to go all the way up here to get so far away from hopefully God and definitely the Ninevites that he, that God wouldn't even ask him to go back. I think that's probably what he was thinking was maybe by the time God remembers me, I'll be so far that he'll just pick another prophet because Jonah did not want the Ninevites to be forgiven and saved from wrath. He wanted them to have wrath. Another thing he might've been thinking is if I'm in this boat, and I'm, and I'm 40 days away because he already knew that it was going to be in 40, you know, he, I'm sure the Lord had already revealed to him that the Ninevites would only have 40 days from the time that Jonah got to their city. So he's thinking, I need to get 40 days away and even more than that so that I couldn't even come back in time for them to repent. Um, but, but you know that he was swallowed by the fish and this changed everything so going down here now now again the the world is small in the sense that the the knowledge of god was all over the world even though there were still a lot of people who didn't serve him they all knew and the people in the 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 men in the boat knew that jonah was sinning because they knew that this storm was not a normal, a normal situation. They knew that some great, great God was angry. And so by casting lots and having conversations, they discovered that the sinner was Jonah and that it was, it was Jehovah, the great God, Jehovah. And they knew they were in big trouble and Jonah knew it too. And Jonah said, okay, just throw me in since I'm the, since I'm the one that God is after, throw me in the sea. And even then, you never know, Jonah may have been thinking, maybe God will let me die 
so that I don't have to prophesy to the Ninevites and they can die too. Maybe Jonah was thinking that. Or maybe Jonah was thinking, you know, somehow maybe this will still stall my getting there so that they don't have enough time to repent. So he goes into the sea and he's in there three days and three nights, which we know Jesus pro uh, prophesied that Jonah was a type of Jesus, meaning that his life gave us a clue to part of the life of Jesus, which was that Jesus would be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. Um, but it's interesting that he was in there three days and three nights, and he also was assigned to walk through Nineveh, which the town of Nineveh was so big that it was a journey of three days to walk through it. Three days plus three days is six days. And um, I know it took him some time to get between the shore to Nineveh, so it wasn't a total of th six days. But, but it's interesting how they mentioned the three days um, of him and the fish and then they mention the three days that he was supposed to walk through Nineveh. But remember, Nineveh repented on the first day, which we'll get to in a later. Nineveh actually repented on the first day. They didn't wait until the second or the third day. So maybe that was the travel time to get there. I don't know. But anyhow, um, six, three plus three is six. And six is how many days man has been alive since Adam and Eve. Meaning, you know, when you consider that to God, the Bible says, to God a thousand, uh, a thousand years is as one day, and a day is as a thousand years. Well, mankind has been alive for approximately 6,000 years, which to God equals six days. And what comes at the end of 6,000 years? Wrath the wrath of God. It's the second coming of Christ. And this is how one of the reasons that we know Jesus is coming very soon is because this it's time. It's the end. We're at the end of the sixth day. It's time uh, for, for Jesus to come. And because um, the millennium is shortly after, there has to be a, a short period of tribulation. And then after that, a millennial rest, a Sabbath rest, which would be day seven. But Jesus has to come, and there has to be tribulation before the seventh day. So, so all of this is any minute because we're at the end of the sixth day of creation, of, of the creation of the bride of Christ. So anyway, um, so here in this story, though, unlike the wrath of the, unlike the end times, Nineveh repents. And um, now in the end times, the world will not repent at the, at the end of the sixth day. The world will not repent. And Jesus will come back. Um, the tribulation will occur. And then after that, the thousand-year rest before judgment day. The thousand-year Sabbath. Um, so anyway... Um, in our time, the world will not repent. But back then, Nineveh did repent. So that was really wonderful. So, but here we read in chapter 2, at the beginning of chapter 2, is when we we read about Jonah's hell experience. He actually saw hell. He may have even died in the fish and literally gone to hell. Because he talks about it here. And then he may have come back to life while he was still traveling in the fish. Um, and Jonah pray, prayeth unto Jehovah, his God, from the bowels of the fish. And he saith, I called because of my distress to Jehovah, and he doth answer me. From the belly of Sheol I have cried, thou hast heard my voice. So Sheol is where you go when you die. When thou dost cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, then the flood doth compass me. All thy breakers and thy billows have passed over me. So he's talking about when they threw him off the boat and he was in the sea and the billows cover came over him. And I, I said, I have been cast out from before thine eyes, yet I add to look unto thy holy temple. 
so he had visions of heaven. Compassed me, have waters unto the soul. The deep doth compass me. The weed is bound to my head. So seaweed, he actually had seaweed in his head. To the cuttings of mountains I have come. Maybe he died before the fish swallowed him. And then he came back to life in the fish. Because it says that he, is because after he went in and the billows were covering him and the seaweed was bound around his head, to the cuttings of mountains I have come down. Now there are mountains in under in the ocean. The ocean does have mountains. The earth, her bars are behind me to the age. Now to the age means forever. That means eternity. So at this point, he knows he's in hell. So when he went down, I, I think it's possible he actually drowned before the fish swallowed him. And now bring us up from the pit, my life. Oh, Jehovah, my God. So I think he did experience hell, but then he got saved. Somehow he got revived back to life. He was in the, and he found himself in the belly of the fish or else he went to hell while he was in the belly of the fish. I don't know. Um, and then in verse seven, the Lord revived him and gave him life again. Okay, and I, with a voice of thanksgiving, I sacrifice to thee that which I have vowed I complete. Salvation is of Jehovah. So all salvation comes from God. And now Jonah is going to fulfill his vow that he vowed when he became a prophet, which was to obey the Lord. Now, again, we go back to the question, why did God pick Jonah? And I believe God picked Jonah, the unwilling prophet, because Jonah needed to learn to forgive and this is a forgiveness story. God could have picked a prophet who was willing to go to Nineveh, but he picked the one who wasn't willing because the one who wasn't willing needed to learn to forgive or else he would not be saved himself and he would not go to heaven himself. And Jonah tasted hell. He, he experienced hell to show him how awful it is and it's not a place that he should want to go. So Jonah got vomited up by the by the by the fish on dry land and god told him a second time go to nineveh and, and tell them i'm going to destroy them and this time jonah obeyed this time he knew there was nothing he could do to escape god he had tried to go all the way to england to get away from god and um he also knew that he himself would see hell again one day if he did not obey so he goes to Nineveh, but his heart still is not in the right place. He, he's highly motivated to go to the Nineveh, though, for two reasons. Well, three reasons. Number one, um, he can't escape God. And number two, um, he, he, he can't escape God's wrath on himself if he doesn't um, do what he's told. And number three, even if he tried to run again, God might catch him again. So he goes to Nineveh, but still hating the Ninevites. Um, and immediately when he gets there, on the very first day, they repent. Now, he was told to tell them that they would, that God would destroy the city in 40 days. Okay. And this is 40 days is an interesting thing. 40 days in the Bible always represents um, being in the wilderness and being under trial. Um, and 40 days was how long the rains came down when Noah went into the ark. And so 40 days also represents wrath. Um, so, um, so there's just a lot to think about there, but, um, instead of receiving wrath, they, re they um, actually made it through their trial and their temptation, and they, they repented. So, um, so they didn't have to endure that wrath. And, and again, this is, this is another allusion to the end of times when Jesus returns uh, because, um, because of the 40-day insinuation, which... Um, makes us think of Noah and the ark. Now, Jonah was in a sort of ark. He was saved in the fish from the waters. 
that would kill him, just as Noah was saved in the boat from the waters that would kill him. And it was a type of baptism for Noah and a type of baptism for Jonah. Um, so um, it's very interesting. <laughs> and Moses, who brought, who brought the law to the Israelites, was also baptized in a way when he was saved in a little tiny ark, only big enough for a baby, and put in the Nile. And he was saved not only from the waters of the Nile, uh, but, but from death itself, because um, Pharaoh wanted him dead. And Pharaoh had actually, um, I think he had dumped babies in the Nile. So, so again, it's a type of baptism. It's also, it's, it's amazing how much symbolism is in the Bible. It just helps you think deeper. Now, I don't want to um, glorify the symbolism because that's kind of demonic. So I'm not trying to glorify the symbolism. I'm just pointing out that God uses uh, symbolism and typology and repeat, repeat, repeat to get us always focused on Jesus and the gospel. So this is really all about Jesus, okay? Um, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to repent. We need to make it through our wilderness journey. And every single Christian goes through a wilderness journey. Um, we all go through a time of temptation. And we need to avoid the wrath of God. And we must forgive. If we don't forgive, God won't forgive us. So all of this is, is about the gospel. The whole book of Jonah is, is about the gospel. Um, so anyway. Um, so, so of course the Ninevites repented. And of course God forgave. Because he loves to forgive. God wants to of everyone and he wants everyone to be saved and go to heaven so god forgave the ninevites and um which is what he was planning on doing all along and jonah knew this okay and the ninevites knew it too in a way because they knew that they had some chance of escaping god's wrath if they would repent and that's why they repented on day one they didn't wait till day three they repented on day one. Now, Jonah, was again, his heart is still in the wrong place. He still hasn't forgiven them for the horrible um, annihilation they did with his people. Um, he hasn't forgiven them. So he obeyed God, but, it, but his heart is still corrupt. He obeyed on the outside, but on the inside, he, he didn't really... Um, he wasn't really in obedience. He wasn't loving the Lord and, so that he could love people. So um, so he asked the Lord to let him die. He, do, he doesn't want to live in a world where Ninevites get off scot-free and are forgiven. He doesn't want to live in that kind of world. He wants to live in a world where, where the people he hates get punished. And um, so... So, so he admits, you know, this is the whole reason why I went to, tried to go to England, was because I knew that you were going to forgive these horrible people. And, and sure enough, that's what you did. And now, and now he says, I'd rather die. So, um, so God says, is it displeasing to you to do good? And, you know, God is good. He is kind. He is goodness. And it's good when God forgives us. Um, he doesn't have to, and we certainly don't deserve it. But it's good of him to forgive us, because he is good. So God teaches Jonah a lesson by using the gourd um, or the plant that would give Jonah shade. And jo Jonah really appreciated the plant. And then God caused the plant to die so that Jonah would be sad and miss it. And God used that as a lesson to him to say, you know, you, you, you love the plant so much, but it's just one little plant that doesn't even have a soul. And yet all these souls, including the animals in this massive city that takes three days for you to cross, you know, a three days journey um, in Bible times, 
you could go at least 12 miles a day, minimum. So that means that that city is at least 36 miles wide. It was a massive, massive city. Millions of people lived there, most certainly. Um, yeah, I had to have some, had to have a lot of people there. Um, maybe not millions, but a whole lot, but probably, um, probably at least, hmm, well, I'm trying to think. I'd have to do some research to know how big some other cities were. I don't think they had skyscrapers as big as what we have today, but they did have multi-story buildings. Um, and people didn't take as much space as they do today either. So um, anyway, it was a lot of people. Let's just say that. So, so God said all these people and their animals, their lives were saved because I forgave. And you don't like that, but yet you want me to save one measly plant that doesn't even have a soul. And, um, and the book just ends there. It ends with God getting the last word. And, you know, I always wondered if Jonah ever repented because it doesn't say that he did. But I think Jonah did because I think that's how this ended up being a book. Because this book is a testimony and it is a lesson for all who read it about the importance of repentance. And um, so I do believe Jonah repented or this wouldn't have ended up getting written. Um, because it ends on the perfect note, how important it is. The souls of men are so important to God and he wants to save every single one of them, no matter how evil they are. You know, there's a lot of evil people in the world today. Um, <laughs> I would name names, but, um, you know, you know who they are. Um, very, very wicked, wicked, wicked people in high places in the world today. And they're doing horrible, wicked things. Um, but God loves them and he wants them saved. Just imagine the most evil person you can think of. Um, you know, Hitler is dead now, but there's other people alive today who have the same mentality that Hitler had, and they are killing people by the millions. Um, even though it's not reported in the news, there are evil, evil people who are killing, committing genocide today. Um, so they are Hitlers, but God loves them just as much as he loves me and you, and God wants them in heaven, and God will do anything to see them saved. Now, a lot of them won't get saved because they don't, they love their sin more than God. But God would love to forgive them in a heartbeat if they repented. In a flash, you know, like a flash of lightning, God would forgive them. And um, his love is just so astounding. And so, you know, um, today as Christians, we see the world getting more and more evil, and it's so wicked. The wickedness in the world today is mind-boggling. Horrible, horrible, horrific things are happening all over the world. There's all kinds of genocide. Um, governments are hoarding food and supplies and letting people starve to death. Um, there's sex trafficking and trafficking of children and babies. Um, Satan worship all over the world, people raping and mutilating other people and then drinking their blood and eating their flesh. I mean, it's, it's just horrific, the violence and the grotesque wickedness. Um, people are selling their souls to the devil to be rich and famous. It's just horrible what's going on. But God love, dearly loves every single one of these souls, you know. And so we as Christians, um, we need to forgive and not, not write people off and think, oh, I don't need to share the gospel with that person. They're too wicked. I don't need to pray for that world leader. He's, he or she is too, too wicked. They're not going to heaven. There's no way they're going to heaven. So I'm not going to waste my time praying for them. We, we really need to not be like Jonah and run from our calling. Our calling is the great commission, you know, and the great commission is, is, 
for us unto the, the entire world, not just the people who we like and think have a chance. Um, we're supposed to preach to the Hitlers too and 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 prophesy wrath to the Hitlers and tell the Hitlers about God's love. So anyway, I just hope that encourages you. Um, don't be like Jonah and run for me evil people. Um, tell evil people about Jesus and you will be blessed. And I think in the end, even though the book ends with God's words, um, I really do think that most likely Jonah repented. And it was this whole thing was to save his soul as well as the souls of the Ninevites because he had to learn to forgive or he would not go to heaven. He had to forgive. And God used him to go to the Ninevites because God loved Jonah as much as the Ninevites. He spent special time alone with Jonah after it was all over to rehabilitate Jonah's heart. Um, and I pray that he does that with all of us as well. Hope that blessed you.